Thank you all for joining us for this session titled A Time and Place, The Art of Historical Fiction. We're very happy to have you with us today as part of the 1455 Summer Festival hosted by 1455 Literary Arts. Time machines may not exist, but luckily we have the work of today's three talented panelists to transport us to a variety of times and places. Karen Tanabe, Constance Sayers, and Alma Katsu are some of today's leading historical fiction writers, bringing the experiences of characters living through moments such as the Gilded Era, Jazz Age of Paris, Donner Trail, and Inside the CIA to Light. I'm so excited to host this conversation with them today about their unique approaches to storytelling, the inspirations behind their novels, and the significance of writing historical fiction. So let me begin by introducing, introducing each of them. Constance Sayers, or Connie Sayers to me, is the best-selling author of books such as A Witch in Time and The Ladies of the Secret Service, and I believe she's already writing her third book. Uh, she also serves as president of GovExec. Karen Tanabe is the author of six novels, perhaps even more, including a soon-to-be motion picture, The Gilded Years, I believe. She's also a former reporter for outlets such as Politico and The Washington Post. And Alma Katsu spent 30 plus years uh, in intelligence uh, at various agencies. And she's the award-winning author of novels um, from historical fiction also to thriller and horror, uh, quite the span. Um, so ladies, thank you so much for joining today. So let's jump right in. Um, this is a, is a conference and a festival about storytelling. So for each of you, how do you define storytelling? And what do you think differentiates different types of storytelling versus journalism or investigative reporting? And Alma, why don't we start with you? Okay, well, I guess the main thing I would say is that, you know, I think of storytelling as an art and I can't remember who the famous person is who said it, right? But art is the mirror we hold up to life that helps us better understand what life is. And I'll tell you, I didn't really grasp that as fully as I did, you know, until I started writing, especially that first book, right, ladies? Because often that first book, is the most personal book. It's usually the book where we're trying to figure out the things that we haven't figured out and are realized and we don't realize that till it's, till it's over. But you know, if you think about the strongest life lessons that you've learned, it's probably come through a story. You know, we're just hardwired to, uh, to learn things that's, that way. And that's why it's so rewarding to write historical fiction because, you know, I think we're all able to take things that people have at least some familiarity with and, and turn it into, you know, a learning moment perhaps for readers. Absolutely. And I think, as you said, the art of it um, is something we really want to get into today. Karen, how about you? Yeah, well, you know, I started not writing fiction. And I think, of course, journalism is still storytelling in a way. But there's so much time pressure on journalism right now. I mean, it's so much about getting the story out, the truth, you know, the facts out correctly, and not about weaving it into this, like, beautiful narrative. Um, which I totally get, but when I was working as a journalist, I was like, but I want to, I want to work on the sentence. And they'd be like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares about your adverbs. Um, so I, I think, you know, the nice thing about storytelling is it also partly is the gift of time, right? Like the time to just sit down and tell a story, an important story. And I loved the way Alma put it. I'm not going to put it any more beautifully than she did, but um, it's also just Fun, you know, and to me, stories, they, they're written down or they're just like really fun tales told at cocktail parties, you know, some of the greatest stories you ever hear are verbal. And then you're like, man, I wonder if I can steal this from my book. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think storytelling is, is, is important, but also joyful. Great. That's great. And Connie? I think that I, I recall, you know, growing up in the summers in Pennsylvania and we used to have this eccentric old uncle. He would sit under the apple tree and you, know, you would kind of go and sit at his feet and he would tell you like the same thing my grandmother had told me, but he'd have these just like elaborate artly, you know, kind of woven tales 
that would just have you wrapped for like a long time. And I, I just remember thinking, okay, that was really great storytelling. And I will say for my own personal fiction, um, when I actually got away from my own story and actually began to think of telling a story that was interesting, kind of like looking back at like, why was I always so wrapped by what he would talk about? It was because he actually just kind of like really connected with me and had these like, you know, elaborate exact, you know, kind of exaggerated great little things that he would like communicate with me on. And that was what I just kind of got out of myself for my first book and actually thought like, okay, I need to write a story that people will enjoy just like I used to enjoy that. And that actually, I think if I wouldn't have done that, I probably would not have gotten that far with The Witch in Time. That's my own personal story on that. And picking up on that, so for each of you in your fiction, um, are there still pieces of you in there? Are there, you know, how much does that play into each of your writing as you continue to evolve your stories? Well, I, I started, so I, I definitely, yeah, yeah I, I think that, um, by that I mean, like, I think my first novel, like when I, my first drafts of my very first novel were very much like things I was working through or things that mattered to me. And, and, and sometimes I would get very defensive about them and like, you know, just because like they were just so close to me. And, and I started to look at stories that I liked to read and it wasn't what I was writing. And so I was like, okay, take this, leave, you know, leave pieces of it. Like I still love to actually drop stuff that people who know me know that I love. And, and like the, you know, most of my novels are set in Paris. I love that. So there are things that I think that, that are woven through my books that are, are me. And I write a lot about music. That's, you know, I've had a long career as a, as a DJ on, you know, for a radio station. And those are things that I think are like peppered through the books, but it's kind of, and it, it's themes that I, I care about but it's less about like something I'm trying to work through in a book. And I think that no one really wanted, no one wanted to see that. What people wanted to see, I think were like compelling characters. And I had to step away from myself, I think. And that, you know, and that's just my take on it, but that was what I had to do to actually make a book good. And that's because Connie, you're so, you're a conscious person, right? Unfortunately, what I'm talking about is the subconscious thing that as writers, especially when you're starting out, you're not aware of. I mean, it was certainly true for me. And so if anybody wants to get an unfortunate look into my psyche, they can go read my first book, The Taker. Uh, <laughs> it's a pretty wild, dark book. So I'm not sure, you know, anyway, but I'll tell you what really struck where that really struck home, it was when I was in grad school. And you know, you, when you're in a grad writing program, you do a lot of critique classes. And I would notice that my uh, cohorts, you know, my fellow students, their stories all seem to be grappling with something about their personal lives, but they were not aware they were doing it, even though it was aware to everybody else in the class, you know? So it's that unfortunate thing. But I'll be happy to say that, um, like Connie, I think I've learned <laughs> to step away from that, you know? So when I'm writing reimaginings of actual events like The Hunger, uh, which is a reimagining of the story of the Donner Party, mm -hmm. you know, I'm so trained in on the history and the, the people who actually experienced the event that there really isn't any room for me in there, thank goodness. And although I won't talk about it much in this because it's not a historical book, my most recent book is Red Widow, the spy novel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it only took me 10 years as a published writer to <laughs> actually get around writing a spy novel when that was my career. Um, and people ask me all the time, like, which character are are you in the book? And I'd have to say I'm neither, although they are, there's a lot of people I know or types of people that I've worked with over the years in the book. Although there's a little bit of me in one of the characters, the older uh, female CIA agent who's a little bitter from her experiences. There's a little bit of me in there, I'll own up to that. I love these answers. I am. Um... <laughs> My first book was like a total Romana Cliff about my time at Politico. So like, there's no way I can even think about saying that I wasn't everywhere in that book. I used to get text messages being like, it just sounds like having a conversation with you. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, I get that. And then I, I definitely did try to step away from it, but I always, I don't know. My voice was always somewhere, is always somewhere. It's usually the sassy friend um, just that's a lot like me and then sometimes it's the antagonist who's evil and they just sound like me too but um so I don't know I feel like it'll always happen to me and then my newest book A Woman of Intelligence um 
is is I like dumped my heart into it on purpose. It's very much about a mother going through postpartum depression mm. and all her challenges, like holding on to herself as a new mom. And I was writing this during COVID with two toddlers at home. And I just, I just leaned in. I mean, there was no way I couldn't, I feel like I left my, it was either like my anger went into my book or it went into like killing squirrels in my backyard. So it was the healthier <laughs> well, we're, we're very happy that it went into your book. So are the squirrels. <laughs> hey, I will say just one, one note, my sister called me um, after Ladies of the Secret Circus got uh, published and she said, I'm just gonna say something. And I was like, sure, you know, your sister's always gonna like levy that great thing. <laughs> She said, you know you wrote about dad. And I was like, oh. And so what she meant by that was the demon Althakazar was actually my father. So take <laughs> that what you will, that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> like, okay. <laughs> so how, let's talk about the writing process a little bit for each of you. Um, how, how long would you say you research before you start putting pen to paper or, or Key, hand, fingers to key, keyboard or whatever um, or do you just like how does it flow and and the other question to that is I've I know for other writers I've spoken to they talk about exercising the muscle and just writing every day even with a full-time job um, that's a two-parter that's very different but I'd love to throw that out to whoever wants to to grab either of those one is research and then one is do you write every day Karen, why don't you start? Um, yeah, so research, I think, is really can be very dangerous. There's like nothing that can slow you down more than research because it's like for your book. So it sounds like a great idea. It's kind of like a granola bar or something. It's like it's supposed to be healthy. <laughs> it's like definitely full of sugar. Um, so it's like justified because there's like brand. That's like how I see research. I mean, I do probably a month's worth, I'd say, before I get started. And then I just have to start writing and I just fill in the blanks later. It'll be like dialogue, dialogue, fill in later, dialogue, dialogue, like building in Manhattan, Google one later. Um, because I'm on tight deadlines, I'm sure we all are. And I think getting stuck in the research hole, I mean, you know, you always talk to people who are like, I've been working on a book for eight years. I just like can't stop researching. It's so fascinating. And you're like, but just stop, like, just stop, you know? No one expects you to be, get a PhD in, you know, like witchcraft or whatever, like, <laughs> like Connie's doing, but, um, which is very soon. I mean, I'd love to get a PhD in witchcraft, but, um, <laughs> So yeah, I think I think you have to not get bogged down. I think it's super important. Um, while on the other hand, you have a voice telling you that like you'll get emails telling you where you're wrong, but you just got to do your best and quickly. And then for writing every day, I, I believe in quantity. I mean, the more you have, the more you can cut and replace with something better. You know, I think um, again, you can't just like try to work on one sentence for like three days and make it beautiful. You won't get anywhere. So I think, but of course there are days you can't write, you know, I think maybe we all do this, but I look at my word count, I kind of break it up and I'm like, how screwed will I be if I take this week off and then uh, go from there? I mean, but writing every day makes you better. I certainly think so. I think that's because you're a journalist though, don't you, Karen? I mean, I think that, you know, you, your background, I think in working, you know, as a journalist, I mean, I just know from working at National Journal and seeing yeah in the Atlantic and seeing journalists who just, I mean, you know, yeah, you might want to dig in on that sentence, but they don't have, I mean, I would watch, you know, brilliant prolific writers at, at both National Journal and the Atlantic and even at Cuff Exec where I'm at right now, where they just, I mean, it's, they have to show up every day with word count. And there is, you know, there is a discipline, I think that comes with that, that I think journalists, I think learn really well, you know, and, um, you know, so I mean, I think that that, and I think Alma as well. I mean, I think the the three of us have also had jobs that have like hard deadlines, and so I do think that there's a discipline that kind of comes with that. You know, you can't you can't just you know you you can't, you can't stall too long, or you know what's coming. Give <laughs> <laughs> right. us back our money. <laughs> That's what's coming. <laughs> I feel in some ways that Karen and I are like, we're separated at birth because I have the same 
attitude towards research. And this is usually where historians get really mad at me because I tell people for the historical horror novels that I write, I generally only take about two weeks to do the research. But I'll tell you, I was a researcher basically for 35 years in intelligence, right? I, I'm a professional researcher. And over that time, you learn to trust your instincts, to develop a lot of shortcuts. And, you know, so I can rely on that. But I'm very disciplined. I agree wholeheartedly with Karen. It's so easy to get sucked down the rabbit hole of research and it's very seductive. But, you know, like she said, we're all on deadlines. I have two series now, so I'm alternating a book every other year. And that's a tighter deadline than it sounds, you know, when you throw in all the copy editing and all that stuff that, and the promotion, right, ladies? <laughs> that goes on, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm the one that, I mean, I, I'll just, I'm the one you should call to kick your butt to get you out of that research paralysis because I mean that's real and people do I remember at one conference somebody walked up to me and they said they'd been researching their book on like ancient Rome or something for 10 years they hadn't written one sentence and you know I it was all I could do to not just like shake them very hard by the shoulders and say you might be fooling yourself here yeah oh my gosh seriously yeah. and that's a luxury or maybe it's not a luxury right I mean there is something to just starting to write I'm sure that gets you going I think that it's also hard to learn to write a book I mean you know I in in um graduate programs and things you know we all work on the short story there's a lot of you know you kind of craft and craft and craft and and I do think um that it's a different pace I famously like or infinitely you know write a thousand words a day when I'm on um, and, and I'm just gonna be serious my first drafts are horrible um but there's something very mental for me having to get up over 50,000 words maybe it's the national novel writing month kind of 50,000 like but, but I think there's a, a really good thing at just throwing stuff down getting to it later I will take a synopsis and basically cut paragraphs, put chapter headings and put that paragraph in there, almost like a screenwriter or a, you know, an episodic TV person would be writing, you know, just because it's like, that's what I have to do in that chapter. That's what I have to do in that chapter. And it really is ugly. Um, I don't like until like my second or third draft do my books actually begin to kind of even look like something that I don't know is a human person like would, would write. And so, um, you know, I, but, but for me, and I don't know if, the, you know, Karen and Alma, I mean, I can't, there are days too where it's just not there. And I'll, but I will sit down and I will write 200 words or I write 500 words. And then there are days where I, I mean, I could really write a, you know, a couple thousand words. I hold myself back because I want to go back then and have something to write the next day. It's just, it's, it's a pacing and a discipline that I think, um, but for me, I get really, really nervous until I have that first draft. I, I mean, I just, I, you know, it's, it's because I think after a while, you know how hard it is to write a book. You know how many passes have to go through it. And you're just like, oh, God, can I do this again? You know? <laughs> and in terms of the relate, you have a, brought up something I wanted to ask about, which is how you structure the story. Do you, go, each of you go in with a knowing, okay, I want to start here and end here, but what happens in, along the journey is going to evolve? Do you start with a character? You know, what, what, how does the process work? It's probably different every time. But. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, for the historical horror, it has been a little different every, every time. I try to learn from the book that I wrote before. So with the Donner Party story, The Hunger, it did very much, you know, it was centered around the, the actual event. And then the more I learned about it, the richer the story got. But after it, when I was working on the promotional materials for Pub Day, you know, the big question everyone asks you is, you know, why write about the Donner story today? You know, first of all, doesn't everybody know about it? We certainly know how it all ends. <laughs> um, right. And then, you know, why today? And when I was doing that research, that's when I really saw that the themes that I learned about when I was writing the book, that is, you know, there were probably would have been a lot fewer deaths if they had cooperated with each other, but they were really torn apart, especially by class structure. And they pitted like the upper class people against the middle class people. And that was very reflective of what we were going through at the time in history. I wrote that during the 2016 presidential campaign and election. 
So it was kind of eye-opening when I then said, wow, look at this famous disaster and how much it parallels what we're going through right now. So then when I wrote the second book, The Deep, which is based on the sinking of the Titanic and its sister ship, the Britannic, I thought, ah, I'll do it backwards this time. I'll look at history and see what were the big thematic societal issues of the time and see if that's something that kind of parallels what we're going through right now. And sure enough, it did. So that's been sort of the lesson of writing these books in that it's often history is repeating itself because we're not learning as people were just not learning these key lessons. So the third historical horror, which comes out next year is based on the Japanese internment camps. And that's very personal to me because I'm half Japanese. My husband's half Japanese. My mom grew up in Japan during the war. His whole family was interned. So for decades now, you know, that's what it's, it's just, you know, ingrained in the family history and psyche. And we've known so many people that went through it. And sure enough, when that book started coming together was when the anti-Asian hate just like took off across this country in the past year. And so, you know, it was like a big lesson, right? Coming down from above, maybe you should write about this. And uh, yeah, so, so that's how the books have come about from me, you know, rather than being just triggered by the historical event, but being able to sort of um, embrace the bigger picture and really look at, you know, well, what's the meaning for today? Karen, how about you? Um with, I'll focus on the Gilded Years just to start with some of the similar tension. Yeah. So the Gilded Years is my only book really written about like a real person. Mm -hmm. um, it's about a woman named Nita Hemmings who was the first black graduate of Vassar College. I also went to Vassar College. Um, and she passes white until her roommate outed her just before graduation. And so that was a very different process from anything I'd ever written or have written since. I spent a long time on research. I, you know, driving around New England and New York State and in archives and like diving really, really, really deep. I also knew how it ended because it's a real person. So I think that shifts everything. You can't, well, I mean, of course you can change their lives. There's like a Lincoln and vampires book, I think, but um, you know, <laughs> we can do whatever we want, I suppose, within reason. But I wanted to sort of stay true-ish to history. Um, and I think, uh, I think like Alma brought up, people know how it ends. I think that's sort of a tough thing. It's like when people do know how it ends, like how do you surprise them? Because they can just Google and figure out how it ends, right? like the roommate outs her, it's on, I think it's on the book jacket, like, you know, this is coming. So then it's very much about like tension building and how to keep people reading and excited, even though they know the end. Um, but for me, usually it's just like one thing that I could sum up like in a sentence, you know? Um, I also wrote about Japanese interment and the one sentence that like, started the book was my husband who's German American asked me, he goes, were the German Americans in turn during World War II? And I was like, no. And I was like, I don't know, maybe. And I Googled it and I was like, wait, yes. And that was it. So that was the basis for the book. Or when I started writing Women of Intelligence, I went to my editor and I was like, I hate everyone and everything. I want to write about a mother <laughs> who murders everyone. She was like, oh, okay. that's <laughs> out of character for you. Um, so we, we made her a spy. We brought it down a little from like hit <laughs> for hire to spy. But like, I knew I wanted to write about like motherhood postpartum rage. Um, but then I write like a three page summary to kind of sell it to the publisher. And then I do a chapter outline. And then I do sort of what Connie said. I like put that summary under each chapter and kind of like try to paint by numbers it a little bit to make it easier. Because my first book was a mess. I mean, I didn't do any of this. I kind of just like wrote wildly whenever I felt inspired and I had to like re rewrite wildly after that. So I try to avoid that now. <laughs> book, I mean, you have kind of an infinite amount of time to get it done, right? You're like, you know, you're perfecting it until you get an agent and then an editor. And, you know, and then I just remember, you know, after signing, you know, my first, contract and I have a three book deal and I remember thinking like I remember the call where it was like great and so you'll be turning this next book in in 
eight months from now. And I just remember having that, you know, complete panic. And so a lot of like the just guerrilla tactics that I use I, I just came from that experience. And, you know, I usually start with a, what if this happened? And I, I, that, I love that. And I usually, I say that I usually know the ending, but the last two books I have changed the ending. Um, the one I'm working on now, um, which is about a, um, a, a film set in, uh, in France in 1968. They're kind of a, you know, a, a new wave film director is, is shooting a horror film and the starlet goes missing mid scene and she ends up inside of her film. Mm -hmm. And so, and you've got a modern day documentary filmmaker who stumbles upon this kind of, you know, like kind of actually finds her. And so it's a, you know, so it's, it's an interesting, um, but again, it's like, well, what if? And then I, you know, like Karen had said, you know, I have to sell it to the, to the publishing house. And so you do have to, which I think is really good. I actually, they kind of like, you know, you have some proof points that you have to kind of hit and I think it's really good. So, you know, like, here's what I think I'm going to do in three pages. And then, but I also, you know, I, I think that you have to, for me at least, the book is, comes alive when there are surprises that like characters that I thought were minor characters that kind of come out of nowhere. And the book does, there's a certain, like a sort of mysteriousness to, to these books that like stuff just kind of comes up that is not, I mean, I guess it is like somewhere in your brain, but you know, your something takes over. And there are some real surprises in every book that I've had, even though I try to keep it pretty tight, like, you know, the handle on myself, um, I do kind of also let the magic happen. Um, and there is, like, I just, I just if each of you, I mean, every book I'm like, you know, I read, sometimes I read the books that I've written, I'm like, good Lord, where did that come from, you know? And there is that kind of magic that takes, takes off. And I wouldn't do it otherwise. I mean, otherwise I'd just go write nonfiction. And I research <laughs> eight years, eight years of rope. <laughs> so, how much? How much of a role? Like, do you have a love hate with your editor? Do they look at things and say, "Dial this up, dial this"? How prescriptive is it? Uh, well, I've had the same editor for now going on seven books, so I've never changed editors. I changed publishing houses with her. We started at Simon Schuster with Atria Books, and then she went to St. Martin's, and I was like, Ugh! but she took me with her. So, <laughs> um, also, I love her. I mean, I count her as as family at this point, um, and I trust her implicitly. You know, yeah. I she always makes everything better. I mean, she's never made anything worse. I'm always wrong, and she's always right. Honestly, I mean you know, sometimes we'll like fight over fight. I mean, go over like a sentence, certain words. I'll just really want to keep some sentence I think is like the most beautiful sentence ever written. <laughs> and we'll kind of go back and forth on that. But no, I, I think she's amazing. I mean, I really feel like I hit the jackpot the first time out the gate and I'll like never let her go. But um, I think that the editors do this thing. I don't know, Connie and Amelie, you have to tell me if your editors do this where like when they send you back your first draft or the draft that you've submitted, they write you like a letter. My editor writes me a letter, right? Like this three page letter of like, and it's just top heavy with everything good, right? The first page is like beautiful, like, you're amazing, I cried, this was amazing. Then you turn the page and it's like, now you have to change like literally everything, rewrite the middle, cut the end, I hate this character, like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And you're like, oh. <laughs> um, and then you like kind of want to die because you realize you have to like do so much rewriting. Um, but it's a trust thing. I mean, I, I trust her. I know she's right, especially at this point. I know she's right. But is that a hard process when they when there are notes and parts to edit and you just how do you is there an the ego comes in or do you feel I have like more, I have no ego I worked at Politico you walk in and they take your <laughs> ego and like pull it out of your throat um no I I honestly just don't I think I've written so much at this point I never did anything else but writing like I it was my entire has been my entire career and I feel like I wrote for some really mean people <laughs> in my life and they were good at like killing the ego you know I think I think it's it's hard to have an ego in writing because especially now everyone's a critic. What are you going to go on like Goodreads and cry because someone yeah. did one star, you know, like I, I, yeah, I think, um, I think you have to check your ego at the, at the door. 
Yeah, that the, the Goodreads thing, right? That all happens to us on our first book. We're shocked at Amazon and Goodreads. And, and you got to get over it because if you don't, you're going to kill yourself. I mean, you cannot control what other people think. And quite frankly, a lot of them can't control what they think either. One day, they <laughs> a year later, they come back and they go, you know, I reread that book and it really is great. You know, it's, there's no rhyme or reason. But I have to say, too, I, I mean, I agree with Karen at CIA, when you write a, a presidential daily brief, it goes through seven layers of editorial, right? It's hierarchical too. There is a lot of happy to glads being changed during that time. Let me tell you, back and forth, back and forth. And you learn not to sweat it. But I have to say, when I came to publishing and I dealt with book publishers, it was such a relief. And I told them, you know, because you guys are professional editors, it's not just that you feel like you have your ego on the line, mm -hmm. that you have to change something, that that's your job, right? They really are there, at least the editors I've had, to make the book better. And so for me, that makes it a lot easier to accept those changes. I've had my current editor, Sally Kim, who's also the executive director or publisher. I think she just got kicked upstairs again at Putnam. And with we've done four books together. I'm losing track. I, I contracted for a fifth. And I just love her. She's amazing. But the other interesting thing is, like, she's really good at the developmental stuff, but she's fairly light on the line editing, which I, I really appreciate. Hmm. That's interesting. And so she's with you at the beginning of the process when you're going through the development. Is that what you're saying? Well, we talk it through. And then um, when I feel like we're both on board, you know, I'll hand the manuscript over to her and she'll come back. And usually it's, it's, you know, like major things she'll talk about, whether the people right. going or, and, you know, it seems like we always have to change the ending, right? Always have to change the ending. Um, for whatever reasons, things happen, you write the book and then something happens in real life and you realize you can't have that ending because it's too much like real life or it's going to, you know, piss off half the population or something like that. And you have to change things. Um, with Red Widow, the spy novel that I said I wouldn't talk about, the big <laughs> tricky thing with that is there's um, two point of view characters and when one jumps in, it's a huge reveal. And, you know, and traditionally, right, we're taught to have that reveal come as late as possible in the book. But I kept fighting to push it forward because the voice of the second character was so dynamic. And also it, it, it is changes the book. That book, Red Widow was actually kind of patterned after Gone Girl, if you think of the character, the POV shifts and the big mm -hmm. reveal. And yet still my agent pushed to have the reveal pushed back as late as possible. And that ended up causing a huge major rewrite. But in the end, um, and Sally, my editor, you know, she had uh, struggled a little bit wrapping her head around exactly where the reveal should come in. You know, this is all sausage making, right? For writers, it's fascinating. But yeah. For it's probably a little boring. I don't know. No, no, no. It's fascinating. It's amazing the things that a good editor, right, will help you get through and pull the best book out of the rubbish heap <laughs> of all the spots and pages. And it all comes together in the end somehow. No, it's, how about you, Connie? Um, uh, I've had two different, so for the two books that I've done, I've had two different editors. So I've had a little bit different experience than Alma and Karen have had. Um, but I will find that there are some there are some consistencies I think between both of them, which is that in my case I struggled with one part of the book. You know, I, yes, I get the single space, three to four page letter, you know, and everything great up front, and then you know, then it's like all the things that need changed. And there is that moment I think of panic where um, I agree, uh, you know, I agree with the edit. I think that, that Red Hook has had and Hachette have had a really good um, understanding of what my writing is and where it fits in and where they want it to be. So I've never, I've never second guessed that. Um, I work with a lot of people during the day. So ego has never been a, a, a thing on that. Like I'm very collaborative. And so I do realize that like kind of the best is, the best product comes from a lot of collaboration. So I don't think it's that. For me, I look at it and I'm like, oh dear God, how do I take these like theme changes and then break them down into like, okay, what chapter am I going to do that in now? And how am I going to rewrite that chapter to, to address that issue or that deficiency? So for me, it actually kind of becomes almost like a, like a, like a work plan as to, okay, how do I take that and actually take that back to the, to the manuscript? 
because again, I don't often have time. I have a full-time job and it's just like, I need to get that done as quickly and efficiently as possible. So that I think for me has been a really, really hard process. Um, and in both cases uh, of my book, there has just been like the first was Sarah Guan was the acquiring editor on, on A Witch in Time. And she rejected the, so it's about basically four lifetimes of one woman that, you know, um, has, you know, basically keeps coming back again and again. And there's a love triangle um, between herself and a, a, a demon and a, and a painter. And, um, and so in that case, um, she did not care for the, uh, the 1970s, uh, my original concept of the 1970s story. And so I had to go back and write that twice. And I really struggled with that uh, portion. And we spent a lot of time on that. And I will say, I think that ended up becoming my favorite part. On Ladies of the Secret Circus, I really had difficulty nailing um, the journal entries. Uh, people like, you know, there was like, the, okay, they're too short, they're too long, they drag, they're, you know, and so Nivea Evans, who is my current editor on both this book and the, and the, and the next book, um, you know, I think really pushed me uh, hard on those. And that was something that I think was necessary. When people talk about Ladies of the Secret Circus and the things that they really liked, I get a lot of compliments on the Paris that I created in that with Cecile and her sister in the secret circus. Um, and a lot of that, I think, you know, would not have been the case if Nivea wouldn't have, wouldn't have pushed me that, that much on that. And for me, it's just, you know, it's, it's not just like, there's, there, there's a little ego. It's just like, Oh God, how am I going to take this then and practically now put it into something that, that changes this chapter to this, or, you know, mm -hmm. like their general themes like, Oh, you need more of this. Okay. Well, where, where am I going to put that in? And so you have to actually kind of do like a work plan and break that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think that would start to move the pieces around and then your story flow, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. Let's move to location as a character. Um, how important are your settings? Um, let's talk a little bit about DC in some, other, you know, let's talk about location as a protagonist. Karen, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so my first book was set in DC, obviously, since it was about Politico. <laughs> uh, and it was fun, I'm from DC, and it was really fun to explore DC. Also Kramer's bookstore was in it, and then it was like in the Kramer's window for like two years, which I highly appreciate. Uh, sometimes these things can help. <laughs> but it, you know I feel like DC always gets like the political thriller treatment and it was fun to not write like a political thriller about DC you know it's such a multifaceted city and um it's nice to show other other sides of it so that was really fun um and then I've, I've written lots of places mostly yeah. on the east coast but some internationally and the book I had before A Woman of Intelligence, A Hundred Sons, which was my pandemic baby. It came out April 2020, the best month for a book to come out, just kidding. <laughs> um, was set in 1930s Indochine, uh, Vietnam at the time, French occupied Vietnam. And I mean, it was so much fun to write. One, I was stuck, you know, I had been stuck writing it. And then when it came out, I was stuck in the house. So it was fun to talk about Indochine and to do all that research i mean i had such wonderlust after that but then i did meet with a tv writer on billions and he was like well tell me about your last book and i was like it's the 1930s and she and he was like you're a moron why would you write about that and i was like i love it and he was like you'll never sell it for tv and he was like just write about new york only write about new york never leave new york and i was like well i'm not going to do that but then I did send my next book in New York because <laughs> <laughs> I also need to pay for preschool. And, um, but it was fun, honestly, because I couldn't really go to New York when I was writing it. I, I realized how much I missed it. I mean, so many of us who live in DC go to New York all the time. You know, it's kind of part of our lives living in DC. So it was really fun to, to revisit. So to visit like New York in another era too. I loved it. That's so cool. That's great. And um, just to follow on that, how do you get deep if you're not visiting? Like, are you recalling certain locations? Yeah, I mean, luckily with New York, 
I knew it so well from just going all the time that I felt okay. I mean, if I'd been writing about the book I'm writing now is set in LA and like, frankly, I have to go a few times. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I would have been like in a hazmat suit going to New York trying to figure it out. But also all the editors live in New York, right? So some, they'd read a draft and be like, actually, you shouldn't take that subway line. You should go here, here, cut behind this building. Like they just yeah. know it so well that like, yeah, writing about New York for a bunch of editors in New York was, wasn't was too hard. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, just like watching movies, looking at maps and all these things of old New York, you know, reading about women's lives, which always is depressing whenever you go back in time, you're like, Oof. even, you know, I only went back like 70 years, but it's it still very depressing. Um, but no, it's fun to make a city character. I love it. Yeah, um, no, it's so, it comes through in all of your books so much. Um, Alma, how about you? Well, you know, when you're writing historical um, fiction, especially things that are well-known like the Titanic, of course, setting is so important. And here again, I'm, I'm a little bit of a heretic. Well, I think it's, it's good if you can get out and do on the ground research. I don't feel that it's necessary. Um, and maybe that's the spy in me talking, right? Because we, you know, have to know our targets, you know, better than their targets know themselves from a distance. So we feel like we can always learn everything we need to know from a distance. Maybe I'm fooling myself. I don't know. But, um, you know, I did do on the ground research the second half of the Donner Party trip. So from Fort Bridger in Wyoming all the way out to Donner Park. And, I, and that really did help me really like bring the setting alive. Also because I'm an East Coast girl and I haven't spent that much time on the West Coast. So to really feel the terrain and the geography and all that, it, it was helpful. So, I mean, generally I'd say if you can, you, you can afford it, your time and your schedule allow it would be nice. But um, I haven't found that it's, it's necessarily 100%, you know, something you have to do. And of course, with the Titanic, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, <laughs> we had thought about uh, going to the Belfast Museum for the Titanic early on. But at the end of the day, I just couldn't swing that. The book was already being written. So I kind of felt like it wasn't necessary. I'm the one who sucks all the fun and glamour out of writing, actually. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> You know, and for the spy novel, for instance, oh my God, you know, it's, it's what I did for so long. It just comes to me right away. Like, and people have said that about Red Widow, like they feel like they're right inside Langley and the people who work there, it's like, oh my God, you know, you described it perfectly. What the floors are like, the coffee machines, you know, it, when I, so maybe there is no excuse for, for living it. <laughs> well, I think um, it definitely, it, it, brings it to life. And, but I think as long as you're sweeping people away, it feels like they're with you no matter whether you've researched it or not, for sure. Connie, how about you? Um, well, I think for, for Witch in Time, I remember some of my early drafts, I had like a different concept of it. And I remember everyone saying in the in my you know, critique group that what we wanna do is see this woman in different time periods in different cities. And so that was something I just kind of started with. And I did, um, I did for, for Paris, I mean, you know, go to Paris and I work with a Louvre guide uh, and they have to actually like, um, com I think complete eight years of training. And so I was writing about, you know, uh, basically William Bouguereau was the, the inspiration for um, uh, my, my character, uh, Auguste Marchant in A Witch in Time. And so I spent a lot of time at the Orsay, you know, with the Louvre guide and her just really kind of walking me through um, everything, you know, I'm taking notes about like absinthe and things that were, you know, kind of, a, you know, that period of time. And then we went uh, to, to Montmartre and, um, and I remember her walking through kind of telling me about like Eric Satie and this like amazing story about Suzanne Valdon. And I'm, I'm writing it all down and her saying that, you know, women couldn't walk on the streets if they were a lady by themselves in 1896 Paris. And, you know, those are the little details that like, I mean, I think yeah, as you're looking through setting and you're walking through things that like I stumbled on a couple squares that I actually ended up using. And those are, I think, some of the things that you get from being on, on site. Um, for Los Angeles, uh, 1930s, I wanted to go to neighborhoods that would have been in existence in 1930. And I wanted to like actually see, cause I wanted to kind of see what that was gonna look like um, so setting was very important to me on that. And I remember the, the tour guide that I had there um, took, I said, you know, I want to go see Jean Harlow's houses. I want to see Carol Lombard's house. I want to see where Thelma Todd died and all that. And I remember him saying, oh, thank God, you know, have me going to, the, to Calabasas to the Kardashians' houses. He goes, that's all I do. 
and you know we went to that like really strange house that um that like Jean Harlow lived in with Paul Byrne that ended up being where um uh where Sharon Tate kind of lived before and it's it, it, it you just it just you have all these like strange connections and Taos I went there as well and I mean again you just kind of really pick up I think I don't think you have to go but I think it does kind of like kind of put together kind of a richness of like the way the place smells, the way it sounds and things like that, that I do think kind of um, just for like really kind of do help the, the, the narrative. Um, Washington, I agree with Karen though. I mean, I was really committed to not having Washington be this just like poor character. Um, so for which in time, I mean, she is a media executive in Washington and I wanted to kind of show like a different Washington that people were used to seeing. So that's why I use Glenico Park and I, you know, made a fake, you know, um, art, you know, museum on the waterfront and, you know, and, and just really try to have fun with it and just try to show a DC that I love that I don't think that people are like used to seeing. And so that was, I think, so setting, I think, could be a very powerful tool um, in terms of setting in time. And I think like, you know, like Ellen Karen both said, I mean, it, it really does show you though, I mean, like, you know, the, the plight of women, even as you go back in time as a setting, you know, place and time as a setting it's like you don't have to go back too far to to really see that I mean women the women's lives were not were not great and that was a big theme for for a witch in time which was you know like how you know uh, how the opportunities were so bad for um for Juliet that basically witchcraft was the only thing that got her out of her plight back in 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 the countryside in Paris and so um you know I definitely think that you know the setting is probably one of the least used devices and probably one of the best used devices that can, I think can really propel a story as a writer. Well, and that, that especially as you're dealing with the different times that, that people lived in. And, and that brings me to another question around um, the power of women in your stories um, and, and the tension. Tell me a little bit about the balance between building a, a character that's relatable and likable. You know, there's always so many issues around strong women can be bitchy. You know, how do you create those characters um, who are kind of fighting the odds but staying authentic and, um, and but also often involved in some sort of tension, love kind of thing um, as you were building your stories? I'll, I'll start. It's really kind of funny because, um, you know, again, I try not to read my Goodreads, um, but like, you know, I'll see like, you know, Juliet was the stupidest character. I could not stand her, you know, and it's like, well, she was supposed to be stupid. And <laughs> she was supposed to have limitations. You know, it's like kind of meant to do that. Glad you felt that way, you know, and you're, you're just like, well, you know, I, and, and, and the challenge of A Witch in Time was that they all had to be different, they had to be different women, but the same woman. So, you know, I tried to kind of make that like as they aged, more wisdom kind of came along with that. And so, but they were, you know, Nora was plucky and I mean, I hate that word, plucky. And, um, and I really loved like in the 1970s, again, I think I told you I had to rewrite that, um, that got dark. And that got psychedelic and that got, and I purposely kind of matched that to its time and its character. And so I do think that, you know, like, um, I don't know, I, I, I think I generally, the, the one instinct I think I have as a writer um, is that I, I understand where my characters are going and people may not like them and that's okay but I try to make them authentic and that is authentic and they have purpose and they are going somewhere and they have drive. And, and the probably biggest criticism it took me a while to learn, especially with like Secret Circus, I, I, I likened it to Alice in Wonderland. And I remember Sarah Guan saying to me, be very careful about that. Do not have your characters be observers. They need to have action oriented things that they do. And I, I, I was kind of falling into that trap where like my characters reacted to things and I got over that. And that's one of the things I think as a writer I have grown in, which is that I, I now kind of understand how to take my character from A to A to Z. They may not always be likable, but that may not always necessarily be the case. I think you root for them or you understand where they're going. And I think that I, I think people like Laura a lot in this, you know, I got a lot of feedback that people kind of, I mean, she was very sympathetic. Her, her fiance doesn't show up on the wedding day. 
and she is just propelled into this like I'm going to do things I'm going to do things because this disaster if I stop and think this disaster is going to like topple me and I think people like related to that and again I think you know that's just um kind of just knowing where your character is going I think is the key yeah no that's a great point and something I'm sure a lot of people will take away uh, Alma how about you <clears throat> well, you know, what you've outlined is sort of a, uh, I think, a core issue if, with historical fiction, because on one hand, a lot of readers expect it to be, you know, so true to an error, and and yet in a lot of these, it's errors in which women were very constrained. And so that type of character might not appeal to modern readers. I'll tell you, I'm listening to the audiobook of Chris Bohalian, I'm sure I just slaughtered his last name, his most recent book, The Hour of the Witch. And while I like the story a lot, the way that the female characters are portrayed, which I'm sure the narrator thought was like the most authentic, just has them being very tentative and kind of whiny. And gosh darn it, it gets on your nerves, right? Like you want to just reach in there and say, late, you know, grow a backbone. So, you know, that's kind of, I think, encapsulates what the problem is uh, for a lot of us. And Connie, you know, described it very well, the different ways you try to get around that. Um, in the Deep, which is set on the Titanic, it's during the Gilded Age, the tail end of the Gilded Age. Um, you know, what I, uh, one of the big societal issues at the time, of course, was women's suffrage. Women still didn't have the right to vote. And it was a big issue of the day, both in England and America, which, where, you know, the majority of the, of the people on the boat were from. And so I made that a big part of the, of the, the book. And the majority of the narrators, because there's an ensemble cast of point of view characters, the majority of the narrators are women. And I was able to, you know, have a whole range of women. I mean, the main character is a young, poor Irish girl who's a steward or, you know, basically, you know, um, a stewardess on the ship, all the way up to Maddie Astor, who was 18 years old and had just married the richest man in America, if not the richest man in the world. And he was over 20 years her senior. And so, you know, you got to see uh, what the lives were like for, you know, this huge array of women. I also have one of the first professional women. Uh, she was a doctor on the ship, a psychiatrist, one of the first women psychiatrists on the ship as well. So, it, you know, you just kind of hope that readers will give you a little bit of leeway to, you know, maybe have your female characters be a little bit more modern in certain ways. But, you know, without that, then it, it, it makes it difficult, you know, to be relatable to today's readers. Yeah, I would think it's like you would get criticism for writing true to the time versus making them constrained, but also you want to make them, there's probably a bit of tension that has to go on there as you're writing. And it's, and, you know, it's a reflection of what women face in everyday life. Of course. Unfortunately, it's the same thing if you're, you know, I was a, a manager for part of my career. At the end, I managed an office of over 200 people, right? And yet the criticisms that you, how do you lead when they want you to be deferential and, you know, any um, more forward behavior is seen as aggressive, you know? It's the same thing we have to navigate in our everyday lives. We just have to write words around it too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Karen, what about you? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I feel those the constraints of the patriarchy on every era like so deeply too and and I feel like I'm really only interested in writing women who are angry by their circumstances you know I mm -hmm. I just think that if I were in a different era I would have been very angry at my circumstances and I could not have towed the line and I would have gotten myself into a lot of trouble and that's like what often my characters do um and you know you do kind of try to stay true to the era but there were certainly like you know, these women who are pioneers of every era, like are jerking the rules. And I think those are the women that interest me the most. Um, I mean, in short, they don't, would have all been like burned in, to death in Salem, right? Like all of our characters <laughs> I was <gonna> say, yeah. <laughs> made it through the Puritans. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, I, one thing you said it, that really made me think is likability. I don't think about likability. I don't know if you all do when you're writing female like your protagonist but like I truly don't care I feel like they have to be complicated and honest I mean you know women are 
are mean and disgusting and dangerous and lovely and beautiful and terrible and all these things, you know, we're so much more complex than we usually get written. Um, and I just think it's so important to flip that around. I mean, my last book, A uh, Hundred Sons, I had a lot of Goodreads. We all say we don't read our Goodreads and then we're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> They're like <laughs> Stephanie from Gaithersburg. Said. <laughs> She's the third down. She's still like her too. Uh, no, like a lot of people said, none of these characters are likable. They're all complicated. None of them are likable. But like, I took that as a real compliment, honestly, because I don't know, you know, because men don't like have to be likable. Like Holden Caulfield was an asshole. Like, why can't women be unlikable? You know, I, someone said, Gone Girl, Alma did. She was, Amy was terrible, but like we all loved it. And I think writing women who are not just like likable is is interesting. I mean, that's what I like to do. Yeah, yeah that book Gone Girl really kind of opened the door and made it possible for women to write characters, you know, that are more complex, right? That are going to show the teeth and the fangs and that sort of thing. I'll tell you one thing I was thinking about today. It, I'd be curious to see um, because I'm older, right? And I tend to maybe write a little older. I certainly am drawing from a different era, but I feel like a lot, of, especially thrillers today have a certain voice in them that's very sort of flip and it's a younger voice. And I'm kind of wondering if like a whole generation of readers are sort of getting trained to want to have that you know that voice for them to listen to because it's more fun and it's more flip and that sort of thing and um I don't know why I brought that up but it's just been on my mind a lot like is that going to be the voice of this decade you know so many of the books I get to blurb seem to have that voice in them I think I know that voice you're talking about because I've also read a ton of those books but they all blend to me like I can almost not tell them apart you know if that narrative voice sounds the same and like you know, here's the thing. I feel like we're all still picking up books written a long time ago. I and mean, people are still going insane about like Jane Austen and stuff. I mean, there's still appeal in a in a more, I don't know, mature voice, I think. And mature, not even pegging it to an age, but to a, a style. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. I, I mean, I think, uh, I see, I worry more about thrillers. Like does every book have to be a thriller? Because I feel like there's no, there's so much like, I have to know what happens. I need this pull to like take me through. Whereas I'm like crying over like Elena Ferrante's, you know, novels in, uh, in Italy where like, it's just two girls at school, right? And I'm like, but can't we just write about two girls at school? Like, does there have to be like seven murders and like a missing person in a freezer? Like, not that I don't want to read thrillers too, but like, yeah, I, I think things get trendy and I think it can intimidate you. And I think you have to be like, okay, I need to write like what I want to write, no matter what. That said, I did set this in New York, so I do feel the pressure. To get back to that, I mean, um, you know, I started writing these historical horror novels and I have partners on them and it, they ha I have a Hollywood facing studio, right? The big idea was that these would get made into movies or TV shows and we did get some early success, but same thing. And then you get the advice, well, don't write his, ooh, maybe I shouldn't say this for all the aspiring historical writers out there, but they're really hard to get picked up because they're more expensive to make and more complicated. And you know, so you do get this advice, right? To, to, so now the third book is set in, you know, 20th century, so hopefully it's, it'll be a little bit more appealing uh, to Hollywood. Now we're all suckers for Hollywood. <laughs> hey, better. <laughs> well, you, I, I can't believe our time is up. This has been fantastic. I really, really appreciate it. I have so many more questions, but um, I thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for being part of 1455 Summer Festival. Please check out the other sessions. And I know um, people are going to have loads of questions for you. And um, here he goes. So thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate it. Thank you.